So Stefan, let's now go back and try to put all of this in the context we, we were just ready to get to a moment ago, which is it's 250,000 years ago. For all intents and purposes, we're the same creatures we are now, obviously, minus the environment that we live in. But food and energy are one of our top priorities, right? Like most, I'm guessing, I, I'm not an anthropologist, but you know, it would have to seem to me that security from other tribes and animals and the environment, right? Weather, uh, acquisition of energy and reproduction were kind of the only things that would have mattered, right? There probably wasn't a lot of other stuff that mattered at the time. And acquisition of energy was essential in that it could kill you very quickly if you failed to do that. So acquiring energy, storing energy was like kind of the struggle that defined us, probably in the short term, much more so than uh, reproduction, which obviously is a huge other contributor here. So we evolved over millions of years and everything you said about leptin now starts to make sense in that environment, right? Leptin is a signal that says there's not enough energy and that's what should really trigger the response. So in that sense, it's not surprising that leptin isn't doing the opposite. It's not surprising that high leptin doesn't make you want to stop eating. It's who cares? Nature wouldn't have cared about that, but it certainly would care if leptin gets too low. That should be a screaming signal to go and eat, resist that, resist that sign. What do we know about the genetics, the efficiency with which we store energy? I mean, we haven't really talked about that, but this, this, this ability that we have to get fat is kind of a remarkable thing, right? I mean, we don't really store carbohydrates. We can't really store protein and we don't want to be breaking down muscle to get amino acids. So we do really have to rely on this ability to store fatty acids and excess carbohydrates as fatty acids in a relatively inert structure of white adipose tissue. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think Herman Ponser would be a great person to talk to about this. He Yes, I, I definitely look, I, his book is on my list to read and I definitely plan to have him on to, to get into this. Yeah, he has some good thoughts. John Speakman has some good thoughts on this as well. Another person I should probably have on the podcast. Yeah, so I think there are good reasons to have a certain amount of body fat. And I think, you know, some of them, you know, the basic idea is pretty obvious. You want to have a way to cover your energy needs between eating opportunities. And, um, you know, we have other energy reserves, we have glycogen, but they're just far more limited. The thing that's awesome about fat is, first of all, it's a very concentrated source of energy, right? Like dietary fat is nine calories per gram, carbohydrate is four, protein is four. Yeah, it's anhydrous, there's no water, it's exactly like literally just pure energy. That was the second thing I was going to say is that it's hydrophobic. And so you can store it without having to hydrate it like you do with glycogen. Glycogen, the weight of glycogen, I think is mostly water. Three, three or four to one water. Okay, there we go. And then the weight of adipose tissue, even if you include all the interstitial stuff and all that, I think it's like 85, 90% pure fat. So the energy density is just off the charts, depending on, you know, uh, relative to any other storage method that the body has. And so it makes sense that that's kind of our long-term energy buffer. By the way, just for people who think about EVs and stuff, like there's no battery that can come close to the energy density of our fat, just to put that in perspective, right? Like, or any hydrocarbon for that matter. Yeah. So, um, and so I think the importance of that is obvious to have a way to cover times when you don't have as much energy coming in as you would like. And in the evolutionary context, you know, the thing that comes to mind from our modern perspective is whether they find food or not, but there's also the question of illness. And I think that's a really important one. So if we look at um, the primary causes of mortality in children under five in low income settings, what we see is that it's strongly related to their weight for height, which is kind of a different way of measuring 
BMI. And, um, and it's also strongly related to disease pressure, especially diseases like diarrhea that interfere with nutrition. And so if you look at the correlation between uh, weight for height and mortality, there's a massive correlation. So kids who have malnutrition, moderate or severe malnutrition, that's what we call being underweight to a certain degree, they have massively increased mortality because basically if you don't have those energy stores, you can't defend yourself against infections. And so it's not just about energy. You know, there are other nutrients that are important, vitamin A and, and some other things, but energy is, is huge. And so there's this, because it's such a huge uh, source of mortality, especially in kids, there's this massive selective, selective pressure to maintain a certain amount of uh, energy storage in the body. So that would be, you know, just an example of a selective pressure that would um, select for a certain amount of body fat. And it is interesting in this regard that humans have a lot more fat than our closest uh, primate relatives. So chimps are like mid single digits fat and they don't develop obesity. They cannot physiologically develop human like obesity is my understanding. Um, so we're kind of special physiologically in hmm. our capacity for fat storage.